Good morning. Uh, welcome to our virtual Sunday school class here at Central Baptist Church. Uh, Donna and I are going to be taking you through the book of James, first chapter this morning. So go ahead and turn in your Bibles to verses 13 through 18. You can see that we're sitting in the choir loft and behind us is our beautiful baptistry. In the Christian faith, as you know, this is one of the first acts of obedience after conversion to be baptized. As Baptists, we baptize by immersion to signify our death to sin and our old way of life and then being raised to walk in the newness of life. We don't consider baptism to be an essential element of salvation simply as an act of obedience and a proclamation to a watching world. Donna and I have watched as our children and our oldest grandchild have been baptized. Our youngest daughter, Becky, was baptized in this, in this very baptistry. Katie was baptized in the Doe River at a church outing by David Crocker many years ago. And just recently, we had the opportunity to see our oldest granddaughter, Lily, baptized in San Antonio, Texas. To a watching world and to grandparents and others who have invested in the spiritual lives of children and grandchildren, it's a wonderful proclamation of obedience. So, we're going to be talking today about sin and temptation. We're looking at the book of James, which is thought to have been written by the brother of Christ, who did not follow Christ during his ministry, but later became a believer following Christ's resurrection. The intended audience of James's book was Jewish Christians who had been dispersed outside of Israel. It was written in A.D. 62, the year that James is believed to have been stoned for his faith. The sins that James speaks about in this letter are pride, hypocrisy, favoritism, and slander. So I think we can all find something in that list to relate to. And if not, well, let's just say you're probably guilty of hypocrisy and we'll just move on. It's noteworthy that these are not what Christians often think of as the big sins, if you will, and yet James devoted this entire letter to them. The scripture is fairly short and very familiar to most of us, but still it's very full, and so I'll read through it, and then we will go back verse by verse to get the most meaning from it. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dra dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us his birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of all that he created. So, right, God uh, uh, indeed uh, gave us free will. Uh, and we want to look at that as we start in verse 13. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. There's much in this one verse. Um, first of all, it's implied that everyone is tempted. And we know that even Christ himself was tempted, so we can establish right away there's no shame or guilt in being tempted, since Christ did not sin. You'll recall that following Christ's baptism, which signified the beginning of his earthly ministry, he went into the wilderness where he was tempted by Satan. These temptations were well thought out by Satan, who used scripture to actually tempt Christ. Of course, he was using it as a bait so that Christ could technically justify his disobedience to the will of his Father. That same thing happens to us. So we have to be especially aware of how the evil one scams us. We may actually have scripture in the back, to back up our actions. 
thoughts or beliefs. But if they are not keeping in with the totality of the meaning of the scripture, then we must reject them. Scripture tells us that God is not to be mocked. So we can't try to justify our sins, Donna. I think one of the first questions that arises from this verse is who is doing the tempting? I remember in the 60s and 70s, Flip Wilson used to say, the devil made me do it. That's classic passing the blame, and we're all guilty of that sometimes. Um, we first heard something similar in Genesis 3 when Adam blamed the serpent, and then when Eve blamed the serpent, and then Adam blamed Eve when they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We should all know that we cannot pass the blame when it comes to sinning against God. He does not forgive us based on someone handing us the fruit. However, if you are the one handing the fruit to someone, you are guilty. Um, sometimes we encourage others to sin by our own actions, and they feel that they have permission because of us. Of course, we cannot give permission to someone else to sin. In terms that we understand, peer pressure comes to mind, and we often think of that as younger people, but adults are equally guilty of peer pressure. I've heard the phrase, I didn't really have a choice too many times. We all have personal responsibility before God. That's right, Donna. God, God indeed, as we said, gave us free will, but we can't make choices for other people. Let's think about the idea of God tempting us. What would even be his motivation? He wouldn't have any motivation because he wants us to obey him. Uh, he doesn't set traps, Donna, for people. Also, he can't be tempted himself because there's no one capable of tempting him, and we saw that with Satan. He has no peers. Satan is not his equal in any way. So in verse 13, we learn that God is never to blame for our personal choice to sin, and others are not either. Verse 14 says, But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desires and enticed. So we could begin by asking, what are we being dragged away from? Good question. I think that would be the presence of God. We know that God does not look on sin. So before we even think about sin or make a choice of any kind to sin, we should simply ask ourselves, do I want to separate myself from God? I know that I don't really want to do that. Lee and I used to have a pastor in Holland that would say sin is what you do when you aren't satisfied with God. And I think that applies here. The next thing that this verse mentions is our own evil desire. Of course, when I'm tempted, I don't use the adjective evil in front of desire. Um, does Satan play into that? Yes. Does peer pressure play into that? Yes. Does our culture? Of course. Any number of things can play into our giving into our desires, even benign things like being tired, being in the wrong place at the wrong time, being with people that shouldn't be trusted. When our children were still at home, one of the rules I had was that they were not allowed to make a major decision after 10 o'clock at night. If we find ourselves in a weak moment with desires that don't please God, we are likely to step over that line into sin. And that thought leads us into the next verse, which outlines the progression of desire to sin and then to death. Let's look at that verse. Verse 15 says, Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. So the progression is desire, sin, death. If we can stop that progression at the beginning of desire, then we don't have to worry about the wages of sin, which is death. That's spelled out in Romans 3.23. What death do you think he's talking about, Donna? Well, since we all die a physical death, I think this is referring to spiritual death and separation from God. Once we pass into the next life, we can't change what we've done in this life. It's too late at that point. So we want to be sure that we don't live our lives in disobedience to God. However, 
we have all sinned, so we all have to rely on the blood of Christ to bring us into relationship with the Father. That's the first step. And as Christians, sometimes we want non-believers to follow the same laws of God that we follow without realizing that that's not their problem. Their problem is that they have not become followers of Christ. Their individual sins are not the problem at that point. Their lack of belief is the problem, and we send the wrong message to the world when we expect non-believers to behave as Christians. Next verse, 16, says, Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. I love that he calls them dear brothers and sisters. Can't you just hear the affection in his voice? The pleading for others to believe, to follow, to be, follow Christ more completely. He loves his brothers and sisters, just as all of us who share the faith should. The question that comes to mind, are we responsible for being deceived. Does that mean that someone else is responsible for our deception? Are we guilty if someone has deceived us? I love this question. And I think in some ways the answer seems a little unfair, but God has given believers the Holy Spirit to help us navigate the world. And we have to listen to that spirit and to the word of God to make our way in the world. Of course, the church should be a great help here, but sometimes the church actually loses its way in the world. I do think that we can often rely on those with the gift of discernment. And if all believers were surrounded by faithful followers, this would be a lot easier. We have to be sure that we aren't deceived or scammed ourselves. And one more point about deception is that I have I've always missed this point in these verses before. James points out very clearly that Satan has nothing to offer us ever. He is a liar. He had nothing to offer Christ in the wilderness because it already belonged to him. Evil has nothing good to bring to the table. Any pleasure that we can find will be short-lived and it will cost far too much. That's where deception comes in. By now, we should all know that we do not have money in a bank in South Africa, and we should know that Satan's hands are empty. It's an illusion, isn't it, Donna? It is. The next verse is pretty familiar and is a popular one that a lot of folks quote, and, and for good reason. It's a great reminder, first, of God's love and his encouragement. Verse 17 says, Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Aren't we all surrounded by good and perfect gifts, even when things aren't going right? The world we live in is a gift from God. The food we eat, our senses, our families, our friends. There is no end to the list of things that God has given us. And while our lives may be incredibly challenging at times, God isn't changing. His love is steadfast. He's proved that he offered his son to pay the debt of sin. Let's look at the last verse in our lesson today. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. This says that God made a definite choice for us to live, and the pathway for that life is the word of truth, which is Christ. God says that we are the best of creation, even better than the good and perfect gifts that we just referred to. This phrase was probably very meaningful to James's audience because they were Jewish, and have practiced the offerings of first fruits. And to me, it had more meaning because we know that James was getting ready to face a physical death as a martyr, and here he is talking about birth. All right, Donna. John 12, 24 records the words of Jesus. Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains a single seed. 
But if it dies, it bears much fruit. If we die without Christ, we're just like a single seed. But if we die in Christ, we have been given new life, new birth. It's an amazing thing to even think about that. I think about all the saints of God that have passed on recently in our church. And I'm awed by their lives and what they must be experiencing right now in the presence of God. They didn't allow deception and temptation to define them. They chose, and they chose well, to follow God who loves them. You know, in thinking about temptation, on a good day, these choices would be easy. On paper, in class, at church, if we're in a bubble. But that's not really how life works. We have to be prepared. And one of the verses that has meant a lot to me during the pandemic has been Ephesians 6.12. Because I have been tempted to think that my, my brothers and sisters are the problem. It says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil. There have been times that I was sure that my brother was an enemy, but that's not true. Our enemy is Satan, and we are living in a spiritual battle. We need to remember to pray for our brothers and sisters and for each other. And I'm going to ask Lee as we close if he would lead us in that prayer. Thanks, Donna. Father, we come to you knowing that when we look into the eyes even of our enemy, we see you. We see ourselves. For dear Father, you love us all. And, and you gave your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for us all. And to be resurrected for us all so that we might live in, in, in spirit with you. Father, I thank you for the wonderful examples that you have given us in this church the pillars of faith that have been shown to us over the decades of what it means to persevere, what it means to build faith, what it means to serve, just ring in my thoughts. I thank you, dear Father, for all those saints that are now gone. And I pray that you would remind us that they chose you. They didn't choose deception. They didn't choose Satan. They chose to follow the one and only God. Thank you, dear Father, for this church, for the many people who've been baptized and the baptistry behind us, and for those that will be baptized in the days ahead. For God, everything that's good in this church, everything that lasts in this church comes from you. And we pray that we may be your servants as we take your word to the world. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Donna. We hope you all have a great week. Be safe. Be smart. Be healthy. Stay in the Word.